Right, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to Queen Mary University of London. So this talk is hosted by the uh, QMGS, the Geography Society. Uh, we're delighted to be joined today by President Mohammed Nasheed. But before, formally, uh, before we formally introduce our esteemed guest, allow me to introduce Dr. Simon Carr. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, yes, you know, welcome to the, the first sort of big Queen Mary Geography Society lecture. I think it's a fabulous thing to, to set up. Um, I've been asked by Jason and Will to briefly, and I promise very briefly, just review the state of the science of, of climate change. Um, as you're all probably aware, this subject is, is really moving very quickly. Both the science is changing all the time, but also the social, economic, political context within which we look at and you know, the lens that we view climate change through is changing all the time. As you can see, even from last week's New Yorker magazine with the, uh, the, the delights of President Trump taking over in America, all things are changing. So what I'm going to try and do, talk about now is why the time for discussion, navel gazing perhaps, is up. And that really, according to the science, we really need to be moving to action right now. The observational data that we're seeing shows that climate change is occurring. Over the last 30 years, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change has been reporting roughly every five to six years on the state of the climate science and what the impacts of that are likely to be, and also the actions and activities that we can be doing as, a, as individuals and governments and societies to, to meet, meet the challenges of climate change. There are a whole series of different working groups. There are three working groups that consider the detail of the climate science, the geopolitical consequences of that, and also how to maybe mitigate and manage climate change. But what tends to come out at the end of each assessment round is a synthesis report that basically gives us a headline story of what is going on now. And over the five assessment reports that we've seen over since 1990, we've seen that the, the headline statement has got a little bit more alarmed every time about the role of humans in driving climate and also what the implications of that may well be. We've seen that the release of greenhouse gases has been one of the dominant factors that have driven recent climate change. And we can observe this from the records from about 1900 to the present day. The emissions of greenhouse gases, whether it's carbon dioxide and methane is the primary ones, are really driving this system. What's perhaps even more worrying is that over the past 40 years, where we've got really good quality observational data, the rate at which we are emitting greenhouse gases has continued to increase, most notably through carbon dioxide being burnt from, uh, being released from the burning of fossil fuels. So today, as a planet, we're emitting in excess of 53 gigatons of carbon dioxide to our atmosphere every year. Since the first report of the IPCC in, in 1990, we've been increasing our rate of emissions of carbon dioxide by about 2% every year. And although over the last couple of years there's perhaps some signs of improvement in that the that rate of increase seems to have tailed off a little bit, we don't know yet whether we've turned an important corner. Because the thing is, is that we know that the ultimate solution to the problems that we're causing of climate change can be resolved by moving to a, a near zero carbon economy. And we need to do that by around 2080 at the latest if we're going to avoid catastrophic climate system changes. Since 1900, we've already experienced about a degree of average global temperature increase across the world. And we're already committed, because of the residence time of, of carbon, carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, we're committed to about another half degree of warming over the next few decades at least. What we're seeing, though, is that that rate of warming is spatially very variable, with particular areas like the Arctic experiencing really amplified climate variations, where over the, the same period since 1900, we're seeing maybe 3 to 4 degrees of temperature increase, and predictions of perhaps 12 or 13 degrees of temperature rise by 2100. The diagrams that you see above show the, the most and the least optimistic scenarios of the IPCC for what temperature will do between now and 2100. The RCP, so the Representative Concentration Pathway 2.6, basically is a scenario that says we're going to stop emitting carbon dioxide to the point that we're going to stabilise 
CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere at around the present level of around 400 parts per million. If we do that, we will still achieve around another degree of warming, which will put us at around 2.2 degrees of global warming, which is actually slightly above what was the commitment in the Paris 2015 Accord. The least optimistic strategy, RCP 8.5, is basically what happens if we don't do anything to mitigate emissions of CO2, and so that we increase concentrations in the atmosphere of CO2 to over 1,000 parts per million by 2100. If that happens, we're seeing temperature increases of at least 4 degrees, if not significantly more. Now, the thing to take from these sorts of diagrams is that whatever we do, and right now it's not looking that good, we're going to, we're going to experience climate change within the lifetimes of the majority of the people in this room of at least 2 degrees, and that that has got consequences. Whilst temperature, precipitation, some of the other characteristics of climate are very spatially variable, the one characteristic that we can talk about as something that we share across the planet is the effect of that temperature change on sea level and sea level rise. This is perhaps one of the most alarming contexts of, of climate change that we're talking about because what we're seeing is changes to our hydrological system. We're seeing decreased loss of ice from permafrost, from the glasses and ice caps in the polar regions, but especially in the mountainous areas of, of the world. And up until about 2005, the, the largest contribution of sea level rise was coming from those mountain glaciers and ice caps. That's why I got into this subject. I'm a glaciologist. I'm not a climatologist. I only got into this because I was seeing that the glaciers that I was working on in Iceland were thinning and vanishing at a really alarming rate. The thing to focus on within these diagrams that you can see above is that you can see the sea level predictions from the IPCC on the large graph that you can see on the right. And they range in predicting sea level rise of maybe as little, 20 centimetres over the next 100 years, to as much as maybe a metre. That's on top of the 20 centimetres that we've experienced since 1900 and the 30 centimetres or so that we've experienced since 1750. But if you look at that little diagram at the top left, that's actually a slightly worrying bit of data because since 1990 we've had these IPCC predictions of sea level. Yet observational data has consistently shown that since then our observations of sea level rise have consistently been at the top end, the least optimistic end of the scale of the IPCC. So without too many leaps of faith we can start seeing that actually sea level is doing something significantly more than we would maybe be initially predicting. And so if the IPCC is right, we're looking at potentially up to about a metre of sea level rise. However, there were things that the IPCC missed. They were unable to put into the last assessment report. And that's where my interest again comes in as a glaciologist, because the IPCC's missed a number of things about the, the major polar ice sheets. Until about 2005, they weren't a really significant component of our sea level rise that we were experiencing. But in recent years, observational data and also better and higher quality modelling of the predicted behaviour of the ice sheets in the future is showing just how critical these ice sheets may be. First up, we've got Greenland, as you can see up above me there. This is thought to have passed through a climatic and glaciological tipping point. As the, the NASA visualisation up there on the top right shows, over the last 20 years or so, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've had reliable satellite-based observations of the changing mass of the Greenland ice sheet. And the thing that we're seeing is that the Greenland ice sheet is primarily dying on its feet. It's going through a, a phase where now, every summer, the whole of the ice sheet is now experiencing net melt. That's completely glaciologically unsustainable. Since 2012, every summer, Greenland has lost significantly more mass than it regains in the winter. Now, we never thought this was possible. Up until about 2015, we always thought that Greenland had been a persistent ice sheet that had been in existence for probably the last two million years or so, throughout the Quaternary period. But literally, just last December, first studies were coming out that actually showed that during the last interglacial period and the previous interglacial periods prior to that, we actually saw almost complete deglaciation of Greenland. Now, just to set that into context, what that means is that Greenland has got about 7.5 metres of sea level rise equivalent stored in the ice sheet. 
If we're now reaching a stage where we think that this ice sheet is glaciologically and climatologically dead, that ice is going to turn to water. That water is going to enter our ocean basins. The outcome of this is that since 2013, since 2014, when the last IPCC models were generated, we now have to acknowledge that at least within our living experience, we're likely to see an additional metre, perhaps a metre and a half, contribution from the Greenland ice sheet towards global sea level. The second thing that potentially the IPCC has had to underplay and not been able to see necessarily is what's happening at the other end of the planet, Antarctica. Historically, we've always seen that Antarctica is, is climatically isolated from the west, rest of the world. It's surrounded by the Southern Ocean. There's a circumpolar current that prevents a lot of heat being transported to the higher latitudes. But we're now discovering that, that Antarctica is not as climatically insensitive as we previously thought. Despite the isolating effect of that circumpolar current, Antarctica, and particularly the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, is actually extremely vulnerable to small changes in sea level. Just remember, just get a glass of gin and tonic or a, a lemonade one day, put some ice in it, that ice will float. Ice is buoyant in water, it's a very strange material. Water as a solid is less dense than water as a liquid, which means the only thing that's holding the West Antarctic Ice Sheet in place is the weight of ice that sits above sea level. The bed of West Antarctic Ice Sheet is, is about 1,000 metres below sea level. So you need an awful thickness of ice above sea level to hold that glacier in place. Now, in recent years, what we've seen is evidence from particularly the Amundsen Sea sector of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet to show that the ice there is thinning at astonishing rates. That the Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier Tongues in the Amundsen Sea sector, which is just down in the bottom left corner here, have undergone considerable acceleration. It's partly because as sea level has risen just a little bit, warm water has been able to get to the bed of the glacier. It's been able to make the glacier more buoyant. Now, those two outlet glaciers drain something in the region of 50% of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, 5% of the total ice in Antarctica. That's, again, equivalent to about a metre and a half of sea level rise. So what we're seeing is that we're now reaching, and we're only seeing this in the last two years or so in terms of the academic research, we're reaching a tipping point where both the Greenland and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet seem to be undergoing almost irreversible decline. Now, the IPCC did realise this. They did recognise this in the last assessment report. But because at, at the time there wasn't enough observational data, there weren't sufficient records to be able to base the data on, and there wasn't sufficient quality of modelling to be able to predict what would happen, they came out with a diagram that showed the accelerating loss of ice from Antarctica and Greenland. And they said, well, we can't really model what's going to happen here. We don't think it's likely these ice sheets are going to collapse. But now we're having to realise that, in fact, the, the predictions that were made in the, assess the fifth assessment report are probably significant under-representations of what we think sea level is going to do. And that perhaps what we're going to see is rather than 2.5 to 3 millimetres of sea level rise per year until about 2030 and then a little bit more beyond that, we're probably going to see double that. So we're looking at rates of change which can have significant impact on sea level. Now, just to show you what this means, I'm just going to show you a very simple model that we can do, that all of you can do, with Google Maps or Google Earth, whatever you want to use. It's very low resolution, but it shows very effectively what the effect of this will be. If we take the kind of one of the mid-range IPCC forecasts of what temperature is going to do over the next 100 years and what that will do to sea level, we can plug that into a very simple mapper that basically will map where sea level rise will go. This is southeastern England in 2100. If we get... Greenhouse gas conditions such that we stabilise atmospheric CO2 to about 750 parts per million. So just under double where we are now. As you can see, large areas are red. Those areas in red are going to be areas that, are, that become inundated as a consequence of sea level rise. The areas in yellow and orange are those which will become essentially uninhabitable because they'll be affected by very, very frequent storm events. And I can see some of you are already pointing at, oh, God, look, that's where we live. It's a bit worrying. So that's, let's say that's a, a conservative but fairly pessimistic view of what will happen. Remembering, of course, that so far sea level has been on the most pessimistic scale compared to our predictions. If we go to that more pessimistic out, outlook, 
and then add, let's say, significant loss of both the Greenland and the West Antarctic ice sheets, that's what the situation changes to. It becomes a little bit worse. The geography of Britain, the geography of the world will change quite considerably. And if we get ice sheet collapse, well, it gets even worse again. Now, that's just showing what happens in your backyard. Let's go elsewhere. We can go to other places. We can go anywhere with this, this mapper. It's great. If we go to the Bay of Bengal, a place that I often sort of refer to, because I know a lot of our students have got family and friends that live in Bangladesh, northeast India, that sort of area. There's, there's the situation under that sort of most, most optimistic of the pessimistic scenarios. If we start going into accelerated melt of Greenland, it gets a little bit worse. Worst case scenario, there you're displacing a quarter of a billion people. Suddenly you think of the social, political, economic consequences of that. That becomes a fairly significant issue. So at the moment, things aren't looking that good. And what I've got up here is this is just a, the whole ensemble of the predictions that were made by the IPCC in terms of what the models would contribute to our understanding of the emissions scenarios and what they would result in terms of emissions of carbon dioxide in gigatons per year. You can see there the, the solid lines are the ones which show kind of the, the, the scenarios which are used in the IPCC reports and the, the final lines are kind of the, the data that they've all been constructed from. But you can see that the trajectory that we're following at the moment is not a particularly promising one. The actual data of where we are is we're just below that mid-range of the RCP 8.5 scenarios. Things aren't looking that promising. Now, this is a really big challenge because essentially if we want to mitigate climate sufficiently that we only experience maybe two degrees of warming by 2100, we've got to be on that RCP 2.6 scenario. We've got to get to a zero carbon world by 2080. And at the moment, we're kind of heading in the wrong direction. So you can see the challenge that lies ahead. And you put that into context of development, inequality, raising people out of poverty. There's an awful lot of challenges that are faced before people can even start to address this issue of climate change. But the irony is, actually, we know the answer. As the students on science and politics of climate change worked out a few weeks ago, the sun emits 180,000 terawatts. That's 180,000 million, million joules per second of energy. We need to capture less than 0.01% of that to fulfill all of our current ed energy requirements. 0.01%. If we took today's technology, so today's fairly inefficient solar cells, solar voltaic cells, and we put them out, that large square in the middle of Algeria there is what we would need to basically to replace all of our fossil fuels in terms of energy production and all of the energy that the human species needs to operate. So it's doable. Yeah? So, so the, the, the value, it's 180,000 terawatts. That's basically the 180,000 million, million joules every second of energy. So the basic measurement of energy is the joule. The basic measurement of power is joules per second. That's the watt. And so we're, we're receiving 180,000 terawatts of energy from the sun. And that our consumption and use of energy is about 14 terawatts. So we need less, significantly less than 0.01% of that solar radiation to be captured and harnessed for electricity to do that. And that's the area that you need to do it in. It's not huge, is it? You know, you could scale down your ambitions, let's take it down to the European Union. In fact, that square will get a little bit short, smaller soon in about two years' time. It doesn't take a huge amount to replace the energy that we need. Most people will say that the cost of addressing climate change is too great. Now, the IPC, the IPCC didn't put the actual you know, a financial sum in their final summary, their final assessment reports. But certainly some of the economic modelling that were based around that suggested that to solve the problem of climate change by decarbonising, 
would cost the world about $36 trillion. That's an awful lot of money. And that had to be spent between 2013 and 2030. If we could do it in that time scale, we would solve, we would decarbonise the issue. Now, to place that in context, the UK GDP, so the gross domestic product of the UK, is about $2.5 trillion. So to meet climate change, we'd need to spend the equivalent of the UK's GDP every year from 2013 till 2030. That would be considered sufficient to pretty much get us to that zero carbon environment. It's an awful lot of money. Let's place it in context. You'll all remember we're still experiencing the fallout from the 2007 and 8 bankers crisis. In three years, governments bailed out the banking system to the tune of $22 trillion. So about two-thirds what we need to pay for for climate change. But they didn't do that over 27 years. They did that over three years. So we were prepared to bail out our economic system to the tune of $8 trillion per year, roughly. So you could argue the case that maybe we should be able to be able to do something more about climate that leads us towards that situation. So my take-home message, the final thing to conclude, is that in this room, on average, each one of us is generating about 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year. That's contributing to that 52 gigatons per year within there. And that whilst part of the solution, and hopefully something that President Nasheed will talk about in a moment, is related to what governments and governance can do to solve that issue, it's also it's partly down to what we as individuals can do. If you don't already know it, find out what your approximate carbon footprint is. It's not a perfect measure, but it's a really good way of indicating your idea of where you sit in terms of your environmental awareness. I can recommend the World Wildlife Fund's carbon calculator, because what it also does is not only does it work out roughly what your carbon footprint is, it gives you ideas of how you could reduce it, what you can do, all the action that you can individually take. So hopefully with that, that gives you an idea of where we stand in terms of the climate science. It's not a particularly cheerful message, but actually the potential for action, and the potential for successful action is very, very strong. Thank you very much indeed. Is that brief enough? That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. I thought that was a, a fantastic talk. Uh, very eye-opening. Okay, so... So about our guest, he is often referred to as the Mandela of the Maldives. He was the Maldives' first democratically elected president, a former human rights activist and Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. He led a campaign of non-violent civil disobedience that brought an end to the authoritarian rule in the Maldives during the momentous 2008 elections. During his time in office, he played a prominent role in advocating for action to curb greenhouse gas emissions. He's the recipient of the Anna Lind Prize and the James Lawson Awards in recognition of his hard work on environmental and human right injustices, impacting millions of people worldwide. The United Nations Champions of the Earth Award and the Global Green Award for International Environmental Leadership. Time magazine declared our guest a hero of the environment. Newsweek named him in its list of the 10 best leaders of the world. So without further ado, I present to you on behalf of Queen Mary University of London, President Mohammed Nasheed. I'll switch myself on. Well, that's a lot of things. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here today. As been pointed out, um, I come from the Maldives. For many people, climate change still feels like a faraway problem. It feels like, for many, that it's something that will affect our children, maybe our grandchildren. But for those of us from low-lying island nations, such as the Maldives, it's not a far-off abstract threat. 
It's a clear and present danger to our very existence. It's happening now. The average height of our islands are just 1.5 meters above the sea level. We do not have even one single hill. Sea level rise of just half a meter would render our country uninhabitable. Our islands are also protected from storms and surges by coral reefs. But climate change is making the sea more acidic as well as hotter. This could wipe out our coral reefs. We are under climate siege from all sides, by rising seas, by hotter seas, by more acidic seas. We face the complete destruction of our homeland. Maldivians have lived on, these, on those islands for thousands of years. We have a written history that goes back 2,000 years. We have a language, we have a culture, and we have a civilization. And while in theory, you could move the people of the Maldives to higher ground, if we do this, we will still lose our country. We will lose our identity. We will lose who we are and what makes us islanders. When I was president, uh, an elderly lady once told me, Yes, Rice. Rice is president. But where would the colors go? Where would the sounds go? And where would the butterflies go? You can transplant a people, but you would lose the mountains. We would lose us, and we would lose what makes us unique. The Maldives risks becoming a modern-day Atlantis. But this is not just a threat to us. The Maldives is merely on the climate change front line. What happens to us today will happen to you tomorrow. London is just only a few meters above sea level, Dr. Carl has pointed it out. Manhattan is as low as Marley. Miami, Miami is even more vulnerable to sea level rise than the Maldives. It is important to defend the frontline states. If you thought it was important to defend Poland in the Second World War, then it is very important to defend the Maldives today. Otherwise, you risk being overrun by the enemy. So far, we are not defending the Maldives very well. The world keeps getting hotter, and the seas continue to rise around us. At the time, in 2014, was the hottest year in recorded history. But then 2015 was even hotter. And in 2016, it was hotter than 2015. Where does this end? And I think we all know where it ends. But I am again here today to tell you that we should not give up, that we can win it, and we can save this planet. In spite of all these, I remain optimistic. In many ways, things were much bleaker in 2009 at the Copenhagen Climate Summit. I was at Copenhagen representing the Maldives. There was so much squabbling in the summit. The developing countries blamed the rich countries for emitting carbon for the last 200 years, for bringing us to the cliff edge. And the rich countries blamed the developing countries for trying to push us off the cliff by, again, emitting more carbon. 
or trying to hold on to the right to pollute as much as possible. But what a difference eight years makes. The science is settled today in many ways. It wasn't in 2009. Apart from a, a few high-profile American politicians, people rarely question the science of climate change now. I was going to name him. <laughs> but I, I was specifically told not to do that. <laughs> and the politics is largely settled too. Now nearly all countries want to act on climate change. The Paris Agreement was signed in 2016, committing all nations, rich and poor, to cut emissions. It's not perfect, and it won't save the Maldives, as it stands, but it can improve over time, and it can be made more ambitious. In future, it might save the Maldives. Most importantly, the cost of renewable energy is plummeting. It has plummeted. Since 2009, the cost of solar panels has fallen by 80%. The cost of wind turbines have crashed. And the cost of batteries is following a similar downward trend. I think governments are starting to realize that development and economic growth doesn't have to be linked to carbon emission. Before when our country's economy grew, its emissions grew. So if you wanted to be rich, you need to pollute. If you wanted to drag your people out of poverty, you needed to pollute. For a politician, if you wanted to get re-elected, you need to pollute. But this is no longer, no longer the case. Emissions are starting to fall. Britain's emissions is falling. European Union emissions are falling. American emissions are falling. And it will probably keep falling regardless of its present politics. For the third year in a row, China is consuming less coal. In 2009, I said that the Maldives would become carbon neutral in 10 years. And a number of people thought that was very silly, a very silly thing to say. But last November, 47 countries agreed to become carbon neutral over the next two decades. What was once an outlandish plan is now becoming mainstream thinking. Renewable energy is so cheap now, in many countries it's cheaper than fossil fuels, even without subsidies. There is a low carbon development strategy. Carbon emission need not be equal to development. You can get out of poverty. You can provide your people with a low carbon development strategy. Take a country like Sri Lanka. It has a population of 20 million a GDP of over 80 billion and rapidly growing. Sri Lanka produces 1,300 megawatts of electricity through diesel at a cost of 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Present cost of producing solar is 20 cents a unit. If Sri Lanka changes its diesel production to solar, the country will be saving over $1.1 billion a year. It's simple. I recently visited Sri Lanka last week. I found that the country's political leadership and the business community is committed to switching to solar. I have no doubt that the Sri Lankans will achieve that. Sri Lankans will clearly show to the world that financial viability and the economic feasibility of low carbon development strategy. I believe 
we can overcome the climate issue through market mechanisms and through the profit motive. In a transformational change, the first few steps are always most difficult to take. The politics is hard. There are huge vested interests holding us back. But we've taken those first tentative steps to solve the climate crisis. Let's be under no illusion. It is still very hard and we have a long way to travel. But at last, at least we are no longer stuck in reverse gear. Another positive development, I think, is that climate change is becoming less of a right versus liberal left issue. Tackling ca carbon emission has become mainstream thinking. To me, being a conservative and combating climate change is perfectly logical. I think, and I believe it would, it would make sense to Margaret Thatcher too. In 1979, at the G Summit meeting in Tokyo, Mrs. Thatcher said, well, I read this while I was in prison recently. Someone sent me a huge book of Thatcher. Um, it, in it, Thatcher had said this in 1979. People who were concerned about the environment should be worried about the effects of constantly burning more coal and oil because that can create a band of carbon dioxide around the earth which could itself have a very damaging ecological effect. The core principle of conservatism is to conserve. There is nothing conservative about refusing to act on climate change and thus risking everything that we hold dear. This is not a credible conservative position. It is dangerous, reckless and extreme. Around the rest of the world, from Britain to Germany to New Zealand, conservatives government, conservative governments are reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And those, who con those conservative parties who do not who do continue to deny climate change, such as a number of American people in the American Republican Party, are becoming globally isolated on the issue. But again, recently, I was in the United States for the Sundance, Sundance Film Festival. I met a number of Republicans, especially Republican entrepreneurs, who were with the same view as I hold that the market mechanism and the profit motive can solve climate change issues. Well, we still have a huge mountain to climb, but over the past decade, we've seen a big improvement on the science, on the politics, and on emission themselves. That's something that's taken 10 years to achieve. So let's not be so miserable. I believe we can and we must solve this issue. There is no plan B because there is no planet B. You cannot cut a deal with physics, with science. You just have to do it. I also want to say a few words on adaptation. Very often, because countries like the Maldives, we will only survive by adaptation. The deed, the deed is done, and we will probably face the brunt of it. And we are facing it. So for us, adaptation is very important. When we think of adaptation, very often we think about physical structures, seawalls, revetments, embankments. But to my mind, 
the most important adaptation issue is governance. When you do not have good governance, you build the wrong revetment at the wrong place, you give the contracts to the wrong people at the wrong price. If you have proper governance, it is more likely that you will be using the money that you have far better than through wrong governance. Today in the Maldives, we have a president and a regime that is very corrupt and corrupt and rotten, very simply. An Al Jazeera investigation last year showed how they looted millions from the state treasury. And working with international criminals, the president loaned that $1.5 million through our central bank. Our president is a corrupt oil trader who for decades sold bootleg oil to the Burmese junta while it was under international sanctions. What's more, the Maldives regime is bankrolled by Saudi Arabia, the world's biggest fossil fuel producer. Saudi Arabia is pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Maldives regime. This money tends to vanish into corrupt central bank and rotten political systems. If we are unable to solve governance issues, it's not going to be the how many millions, trillions, 36 trillion that Dr. Carl suggested that would take us to solve the issue. But if we, if we have proper governance, I believe the Maldives with its own resources can solve our own problems without much international aid and assistance. I think, again, we must rely on the new economics. We must find economic models that would save our planet. And it's very obvious that the received economic wisdom is not saving it. We were taught that air as a free good, how wrong it can be. And the present economics is based on this main factor that air is a free good. Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith wrote it on that basis. We must find a new economics and I believe that new economics is available. And we must find a governing manifesto based on this new economics and govern our countries, our societies, based on that new manifesto. I was initially told to speak for 40 minutes, but it's only done by Castro and Gaddafi. <laughs> Uh, I can go on and on, but I think we have time for questions. And again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to have met you. Thank you. Thank you, President Nasheed. I thought that was very insightful. Um, as you kindly said, uh, you're available to take some questions, along with Dr. Simon Carr. So uh, we've got two roaming mics, uh, if you could grab one, Will and Freddie. Uh, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand and, and we'll uh, try and go around everyone, if that's okay. So, uh, yeah, to start with, uh, any questions, please? Yes. Just in the middle. Uh, hello. 
Um, so during your time in Copenhagen uh, during 2009, you found that a lot of the countries such as the big polluters, India and China, they were very much for industrialization and urbanization. So how was it that you were able to convince them during that conference that it was essential that they get on board climate initiatives? Well, um, I kept on telling them that you are accusing the West of having emitted carbon for the last 200 years and having brought us to the brink. And now these big developing countries must have the right to push us off the cliff. Um, I found that a ludicrous argument. But more importantly, I think uh, uh, many of the countries did understand that carbon emission need not be equal to development. That there can be a low carbon development strategy. And we are seeing that now. China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, they're all going into renewables. So just to add to that, you know, with the, the case of China, you know, for the past 10 or 15 years, we've been vilifying the Chinese government for you know, opening up a coal-fired power station every 10 seconds, it seemed to be, that people were arguing. But the, the reason that solar power has become so much cheaper is because China is producing so many of those solar panels. You know, as, as the world's largest manufacturer of green energy, uh, you know, the, the, the change that's taken place in China is absolutely incredible in terms of you know, how it's changed that emphasis from coal, carbon dioxide generating power to clean technology. Simply because they can't breathe now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, okay, so moving on. And <laughs> any more questions, please? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the okay, climate and development initiative. Um, my question is, uh, with the external pressures on the current government, the more divine government, what else do you think can be done? Because Al Jazeera has already exposed them for their corruption, but what else do you think can be done in order to not topple the government, but in order to make sure that the funds are actually going to the people of the country? Well, uh, another thing my office told me was not to go on and on about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Vincent, uh, row just behind, if we have a question. Uh, thank you. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just had a deep voice. Um, Hi, uh, I thought it was a very good conversation, by the way. Um, I felt that you articulated your points very well. Um, I'm, a, I'm not a geography student, I'm a politics student, and I was interested in coming here because you spoke about good governance, and I was just wondering, whilst you were in charge as, as a Maldivian president, um, did you feel that there was a certain strategy that you were more compelled by? So the idea of good governance as institutions, they obviously set strategy aside on an international basis, but do you feel more sort of effective that the idea is based on domestic work, so stuff that you do on a local level to a national level, the strategies that you implement there, are they more effective? And do you think that they're easier to like, try and put forward as opposed to the institutional ones instead? Because I know this idea of good governance is highly debated. I mean, um, looking at sort of um, Southeast Asian nations with ASEAN and stuff, they have these core values and stuff, and constantly they're considered to be disregarded. So I was just wondering whether or not there is, you talk about vested interests and stuff, whether or not that countries deserve to be focusing more on themselves as opposed to international institutions. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, um, I've never understood these core value things. Um, if you hit someone, if you torture someone, it hurts. Wherever you are from. You can be from Southeast Asia, from Europe, anywhere. If you're trapped in stocks, it hurts. So for me, these values are universal. Human rights is a universal value, and, and it must remain as a universal value. Uh, why governance is related to, uh, and, and in answer to your question, yes, uh, um, decentralization and, and trying to organize things at a very smaller unit helps. It's far more easier uh, than trying to come up with huge big projects. 
a mega project kind of, it's, it's far more difficult. But if you can decentralize, and if you can get your islanders or your villages or your little towns to come up with their own issues, to come up with their own solutions, it's, it's far more easy um, to get it done. You must, I've always found that if you can get the politics right at the local level, it's always easier to implement. Um, in the moment, if, for instance, going renewable is a no-brainer. At the local level, they're selling electricity at sometimes at seven rupiah, eight rupiah a unit, which is about 70 cents. So if renewables, if you can have renewables at 20 cents, it's simple. Okay. Uh, right, any more questions, please? Uh, right at the, the back, please. Um, so this is a question addressed to both of you. So you both seem to um, talk a lot about fossil fuels and the way we can transform to renewable modes of energy. Um, I just wanted to ask, do either of you have any views on animal agriculture and the way that methane emissions tend to significantly contribute to greenhouse emissions and the way we could perhaps transform food systems? Yes, <laughs> in short. Um, yes, you know, I, I suppose the the focus on energy supply is simply because that's the largest component of the emissions spectrum. And you know, if you look at the, the slide that I showed very early on, um, you know, forestry and other land use and agriculture is, is a major contributor to that. To, to that. And you know, it's, it's you know, been long recognized that you know, certainly within Western culture, we're consuming a vast amount of meat, which is you know, having a, a disproportionate impact on, on our carbon footprints. Um, and I know, you know, that the, the footprint that I showed in that, that previous slide just before I finished was my own one. And the largest component of that was because I eat quite a lot of meat. Um, so I can, you know, I can fundamentally agree that actually that's one of the areas that we do need to act upon. But at, at this stage, probably focusing on the energy story is kind of the immediate priority. And I think as soon as we get to some sort of progress on that. You know, it looks like we could be turning a corner. You know, there are enough initiatives which are showing that we may be reducing our energy intensity um, over the last couple of years. Hopefully that will continue. As that trend establishes itself, then I think it's the, the next case is, you know, we've got an industrialised agricultural system. It's not just the, the, you know, the use of, of, of land for, for raising meat. It's also the use of land for creating biofuels. Um, and other things like that. So I think that you know, that's probably the next step as a, you know, the next big contributor to it. But I think trying to do all of them at the same time is probably asking our political leaders to do a little bit too much at this stage. But I, you know, I completely agree. Uh, if I may add, um, you would remember the Green Revolution, um, GM crops and, and, and how India has been able to feed its billions millions um, through the new green revolution. Um, I believe that there is a lot of new technology around, a lot. Um, um, I, I tend to go to uh, a fair amount of exhibitions and this kind of thing and you always have shown an amazing new gadget. Um, so it's, it's, the new technology is there we need to bring that technology into governance. Bring, bring that, build a political manifesto based on the knowledge that we have. Uh, 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 an example I, I use is Das Kapital and the Communist Party manifesto, which is a completely wrong example to use. <laughs> uh, but if you would think about it, uh, uh, Karl Marx had written the damn thing and it was left in uh, British Library here and it was there for maybe 30 40 years and, and no one took notice of it until Lenin came around and said okay let's run a country according to this so my view is the technology is there the knowledge is there or rather the dust capital is there so let's develop a, a <coughs> governance manifesto based on this new technology. And, and let's get a government elected with these pledges 
And I think it can be done. Just to, to flip the question, um, in the, the fourth assessment report by the IPCC, the 2007 report, one of the more controversial statements in the, the synthesis report was, was their suggestion that a transition to more genetically modified drought-resistant, flood-resistant crops was essential to be able to maintain you know, the growth in population of the planet. That wasn't in the assessment report five. It didn't appear in there. Do you think that's something we should be looking at? Okay, uh, we have time, I would say, for one more question, please. So, <laughs> yep, just in the middle. So I heard on plans that um, um, the Maldives are um, building funds to sort of relocate the Maldivians to um, another island, so off the coast of Australia. So I just wanted to know how that's going on and also what's the prospect for environmental refugees and what the international community can do to sort of respond to this because I know there hasn't been a lot that's been done regarding that to respond to small islands. Well, we have a million Syrians on the march. <laughs> Uh, because of the internal conflict in the Middle East and the West just simply collapsed. So if you have, if we have all these billions of people on the march, you could imagine what would happen. So we're not going to Australia, given up on this idea. Um, <laughs> especially, especially after this um, elderly lady told me, President, you can uh, relocate a people, but where would the sound, the butterflies, um, uh, uh, and, and the colours go. Um, I think we should just hold our ground until we die. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I do not believe that we will die. I think we will find solutions. I mean, the Chinese, after they can't breathe, are finding solutions. <laughs> so the same thing happened in London in the 1950s. When they finally couldn't breathe, they found solutions to it. The same thing happened in Los Angeles. When they finally couldn't breathe, they found solutions to it. But we must, we must understand that the window of opportunity is receding. So we must do something while we are able to breathe. And not wait until we are unable to breathe. Uh, um, I would again advocate that we must find, because I, I am a, a, a center-right politician, so therefore I advocate um, market mechanisms, and I believe that the profit motive can fuel change, saving the planet. Okay, thank you President Nasheed. Um, Right, so that's all we have time for today. Um, so please join me in thanking President Nasheed and Dr. Carr on behalf of Queen Mary University of London. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.